arts, culture, and politics to intentionally collide. We believe that this space and events like this one here today can help transform our communities and inspire social change. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging our two co-sponsors tonight, the DC Latino Caucus, which help gets, uh, helps to get the Latino community engaged in civic, in civic causes and political activities here in Washington, and also the DC Lat um, Office of Latino Affairs, which provides these services and information for the Latino community also here in DC. So thank you very much for joining us today and supporting us today. Um, I have the pleasure to introduce our author, Mirto Hito. Uh, Mirto is an assistant professor at Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism. Uh, she's been a news newspaper reporter for many years, working for the Miami Herald, El Nuevo Herald, and the New York Times, where she covered immigration. She's received numerous awards, including the American Society of Newspaper Editors Writing Award for Best Foreign Writing Reporting for a series of articles about life in Cuba, and shared a Pulitzer Prize for National Reporting for a New York Times series of articles about race in America. Today's book, um, In Hunting Season, Immigration and Murder in an All-American Town, Mita takes a personal look at the national war on immigration, and through the story of the immigrants' murder on Long Island, she examines the community's struggle with violence and hate and shines light on the national debate on immigration reform. Please join me in welcoming author Mito Hito. very cold tonight, but it's not very cold at all. It's very mild. So, but thank you for being here. Um, you could be home watching TV. This is so much better. Um, thank you to someone who's not here. Um, she wrote to me to tell me that she couldn't come, but she's very much the person responsible for me being here tonight. Michelle Salcedo. It was her idea that I tried all this new place, which apparently everyone in Washington DC knows about. But since I don't live here, for me it's very new, and so I'm very excited to be um, here tonight. And thank you to the DC Latino Caucus. I actually did not meet them. Where are they? Frankie Garcia. Yeah, okay, right. good, good. Thank you so much. And to the DC Office on Latino Affairs. Anyone here from He's there? coming in later. Okay, all right, good. Because um, their support is really, really important. So I just want to have a conversation tonight. Um, and then maybe I'll read a little bit from the book. But I want to tell you why, I mean, there are so many things I could have written about. And in fact, I had another idea I was going to do another book that had nothing to do with immigration or murders or hate crimes. Um, and that felt through what I was kind of looking for a project. And as some of you know, I teach a class on immigration reporting, a seminar that I've developed at Columbia University. One of my students in 2009, I believe it was, yes, in the spring of 2009, was very busy working on a documentary. And in fact, that, he said that was the reason he was taking the class, so he could learn how to report on issues of immigration, because he was working on a documentary about this very murder, but I didn't know that at the time, for his master's project. And finally, in the fall, he invited me to see the project, in the fall of 2009, and it's a very good documentary, 32 minutes, produced by two students, a master's project called Running Wild. And when I saw it, I was very impressed by the caliber of the work, but also, um, frankly, shocked at the crime. And I saw the possibilities, and I realized that there was a book, there was a lot more that I could say, a lot deeper that I could go with the book. And so, in January of 2010, I began reporting this book. It took about three years. The motivations, people always ask me why this and not something else. I think I have three very good reasons. First of all, the nature of the crime. Um, some of you may know what the book is about already. In January, November 8, 2008, a 37-year-old immigrant from Ecuador was attacked and killed by a group of teenagers in a town called Patchogue, not very far from New York City, about 60 miles away. Um, that's horrific enough, but 
they uh, were immediately arrested and they immediately confessed that this wasn't the first time they did this, that in fact they went around entertaining themselves with this activity which they called hunting beaners. Beaners as in beans, as in black beans or red beans, as in frijoles, or hopping beaners, or, you know, a series of derogatory terms. But that was the idea. They went around doing this. And you know, I'm the mother of three Latino boys who are now 19, 13, and 10. Some of you in the audience know them. Um, boys who speak Spanish very proudly, who are, were born in the US, um, who do not hide their ethnicity, and who don't think anything about speaking Spanish anywhere they are. I mean, they're never, they have never been afraid. It's, it's not an issue for them. And the thing that was really scary about this when I began looking into it is that they were looking for a certain type they said they went out looking for Mexicans. But in fact, Marcelo Lucero was from Ecuador. And the person they attacked right before Marcelo Lucero, who thankfully was not killed, was a naturalized US citizen from Colombia who had lived in the US for more than 30 years. So what's a Hispanic? How do you profile the kind of person that you want to attack? Um, what does your life depend on? Is it the color of your hair? The Colombian that I was just referring to who was attacked did not look anything like Marcelo Lucero. Is it the height? Is it the tone of the skin? Is it the accent? Is it the way you walk, perhaps? Hands deep in the pocket, head down, not wanting to attract attention? I don't know. And so I, um, I wanted to look into it. I wanted to understand what was going on in that town where seven kids could do something like this. And I'm aware that they were not the only ones. I mean, these were packs of kids like wolves going around attacking the immigrants. Um, the second reason is that years ago when I was a reporter for the New York Times, I had written a story about something that sociologists had just then began noticing, which was the movement of immigrants from urban centers to suburbia, not as we have traditionally done it, which is we live in the cities for a little while, make enough money and move out to suburbia, but bypassing the cities altogether. Just arriving at JFK and having enough contacts, enough friends, enough of an enclave to be able to go to Patchwater or Medford or other places, in this case, Suffolk County, and just completely bypass the city experience. That's an interesting phenomenon because the cities have traditionally served as a buffer, as a place where immigrants have assimilated. The cities are used to it, they know how to do it, they have the resources, they have the programs, they have the funds to do it. Suburbia is not. And all of a sudden you have these hundreds, if not thousands of people moving into communities where people had moved to those communities precisely so that they wouldn't have to deal with those pesky issues of urban centers immigration among them. So that presented a conflict for both of those groups. And I wrote about this when I first heard about it. I think it was in 1996 or 1997. It's in the prologue of the book. And then I meant to follow it up. Um, and I never did. So this was kind of my big follow-up. The book that allowed me to tell the story of what happens when in fact immigrants bypass the cities. And the third reason I was attracted to the story is because I'm very aware of the danger of labels. And because I am an immigrant myself, I came from Cuba in 1980 and the Maria book lived. That was a very chaotic event that brought more than 125,000 people from Cuba to Key West in the span of five months. Um, I wrote a book about it, about that, which I think they have here, Finding Manana. That was my first book. And when we, um, in that boat lift, there were some people who came from Cuba who were criminals who had committed crimes in Cuba over committed crimes in the US. They, though they were clearly a minority, they gave all of us a very bad name. 
And very quickly we were saddled with the term Americus, <coughs> which was meant in a derogatory way, but which I actually like and use all the time with pride. And, um, but I'm aware that it was very harmful. And I'm aware of what it did to the community, not just to the Cubans like me who came in the book lift, but to the entire Cuban community that had a terrific reputation and they had worked very hard for that reputation and that community was somewhat damaged because of the perception of who we were and I say perception intentionally because clearly it's not who we were. So those, those were the reasons that attracted me to this book. I wanted to, to somehow touch on all of those subjects. Um, you've heard some things about me. I have been a reporter since 1987, mostly covering issues of immigration on and off, both in the Miami Herald and in the New York Times. That's what I teach now. It's where it's what I'm passionate about. So I wanted to bring all of those things together, and this book hunting season is a result of that. As I said earlier, it took three years. I began with the trial, covering the trial of Jeffrey Conroy, the boy who actually, the young man who actually stabbed. I said it was zero. I should say that they were all 16 or 17. Not one of them was yet 18. Um, that they were not from Patchogue itself. They were from surrounding communities in Suffolk County. They went to Patchogue intentionally because they knew they would be beaners or Spanish people, which is what they say, um, walking the streets of Patchogue on Main Street. Um, the reporting was incredibly difficult, as you may imagine. A lot of people in the town were unhappy to talk about it. They, some people didn't want to deal with it. Some people felt that, um, you know, that it had it happened in their town, but it had nothing to do with them. Some people blamed the family. So this boys come from, you know, they're not part of us. This is a private thing. This, who knows where they come from. But I, I took, I took, I took a different approach. I think these boys were very much part of the community, and these boys were very much the result of things that were going on in Suffolk County for a long time, uh, mainly the last decade of the 20th century and the first decade of the 21st century. Things that were going on not only in Suffolk County but also in the nation. I mean, this, and we're still wrestling with some of these things, right? This idea that. We have 11 million undocumented immigrants in this country that somehow we accept, that we even hire, that we live with, but they're not good enough to be U.S. citizens. So that sends a message, um, I think, that trickles down. What is it about these people? I mean, if you're a child growing up in this environment, if you are an adolescent and you are listening to the news or watching the news with your parents or reading the paper, what is it about these people that is so bad and so toxic that we don't want them to become U.S. citizens? Well, because they're here illegally. Well, if they're here illegally, why are they here? Why aren't we doing something about it? So it's a little schizophrenic and it's hard to understand for, for young, it's hard to understand for grown-ups. Imagine for kids, it's even harder to understand. Add to that the fact that this voice grew up at a time when there were a lot of day laborers in a, a nearby town that really became ground zero of um, the immigration battles in the last decade of the 20th century. And elected officials that um, added fuel to the fire with comments that were uh, really toxic and derogatory, and we can read some of them in the book later. That led to an atmosphere in the high school that was um, incredibly Violent. I mean, if you if you're worrying about if you worry at all about bullying, read the chapter about the high school. It's just incredible. And what was incredible to me, my reporting is that every single adult I spoke to, from the parents of the boys who committed this crime, to um, just priests, rabbis, people in the community, leaders, thought leaders. People I spoke to, no one knew. We had no idea. How can this be?